I welcome all of you joining us here today, and particularly our distinguished guests, uh, Speaker Indra Nui and Rashma Sajani, and uh, also our uh, moderator, uh, Sima Modi, and the co-moderator, uh, Kamesh Ma uh, Nagarajan. When I spoke to uh, AB ABDC friends and supporter about this uh, book conversation, and uh, of course they could not believe that we have able to put this uh, amazing program together. But in fact, we didn't. The credit should go to Kamesh uh, Nagarajan, who came up with the idea and putting all the things together. Many of you know Kamesh, who is the Morgan Stanley, uh, with the Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management, uh, who uh, just recently had been promoted to a managing director of the uh, Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management. So congratulations to Kamesh. Yeah. And uh, Kamesh also is our 2011th Outstanding 50 Asian American uh, Award recipient. And since that, time, <laughs> since that time, he has been a great supporter for the AABDC and recommended so many uh, outstanding Asian American executives uh, for, for the award. And I also especially grateful to Indra, who uh, has, uh, <clears throat> because this is the second time you, know, you grace us with your uh, wisdom and the inspiration. I know that you speak with uh, many of the multiple events, and I hope that uh, you know you will remember in 2020 that uh, you joined us at uh, the Asian American Business Roundtable, and uh, moderated by your friend and ex-colleague uh, Mamu Khan. Right. And also, I wanted to thank uh, Rashma Zajani, and uh, actually, you know, you welcome you for the also the second time to joining us and uh, back. Last October 2020, we had, you know, you were the keynote speaker for our uh, virtual summit on the Asian American women in tech. And that was a wonderful event. And we uh, hope there will be more to come. And we hope to uh, uh, certainly learn from your experience in terms of uh, helping uh, the next generation of women to be in the stand. And we uh, hope, you know, we'll continue the conversation. So today, our stage will be flowing with really uh, talents, and uh, particularly women of talents. And so advancement of Asian American women is one of our you know, goals, and we have done many of the conversations and the conference and focusing on how to support Asian American women. And so we will also certainly want to continue uh, to do that, and with the you know, leadership from, from Indra, Rashma, and many others, I think we can learn from them. And so, Kamish, take it away. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Um, I know it's raining. And I know uh, when we started out, we wanted to make this sort of an, an intimate event, and it, and it is. But e even the numbers we had were, like, oversubscribed. So thank you all for coming out. Thank you, John, and thanks to AABDC. Um, and our sponsors today for sponsoring this important discussion, and as I hope the beginning or continuation of a national global dialogue on these types of issues. It's an honor to be introducing and to have had some hand in shaping this panel today. I have to admit it's a very important topic to me personally, as I've grown up in a matriarchal family, uh, where the women were not only the backbones of the family, which were my two grandmothers in Chennai, uh, Madras, and unquestioned leaders of the family, but many of the women in my family have reached great heights in their professional pursuits, whether it be professional, artistic, entertainment. Um, my mother has a double master's, one in philosophy and one in computer science, and is the heart of our family. Um, when I started in wealth management, I started working with a team led by a woman in Rochester, New York, who's still one of the best advisors in our industry and someone I learned with. I grew up on the wealth management side where equal pay and equal opportunity are cornerstones of the wealth management side of the business. I have a daughter who absolutely runs the household and is now 13. So definitely a, a young woman uh, and I strive to be better and I honestly admire and learn from everyone on this panel who I'm lucky to have a relationship with. Both Indra and Reshma have established themselves as thought leaders on many topics, and I, t I think today, um, both in different ways and, and really interesting where they came from in the background of different times, some of the common themes I think that SEMA will be leading today will focus on equal pay, equal workplace opportunities, 
subsidized childcare, paid leave, and how we value home and family care and truly kind of share the load uh, for a lot of us men in the room, share the load at home in supporting the family. We may think we all get it right, um, but reading both books and reading Reshma, I realized that an Instagram of me with my daughter shouldn't be a, a necessarily rewarded as that you're a great dad. Uh, it should be the norm. And so uh, I continue to learn. Uh, we'll just start, uh, in, before I introduce the panel, with uh, just a quick bio. I think you know everyone, but Indra Nui, uh, former CEO and chairman of PepsiCo one of the world's most admired business leaders. She currently serves on the board of Amazon, Philips, and was the first woman independent director of the International Cricket Council. She's a member of the Arts Academy of Arts and Sciences, the MIT Corporation, and the board of Memorial Sloan Kettering. She's the class of 1951 chair for the study of leadership at West Point. She is a revered global role model who has long spoken about women, equity, inclusion, and the global economy to support families. Her first book, My Life in Full, Work, Family, and Our Future, um, everyone has a copy. So for those who haven't read it, it's a fantastic read. And uh, you'll have a chance to, uh, to read it as you go from here. She's married and her husband, uh, Raj Nui. And she has two daughters, Preetha and Tara. Um, I will not say anything about Raj, because he's not here. Indra has been a very influential person in my life as we are related as second cousins uh, by her mom and, and my father. Um, what I've learned and hopefully continue to learn is uh, you have two ears and one mouth, so listen more than you speak. Her humility and deep loyalty to family is a core part of who she is, and she's been available to me through the highs and most importantly through the lows, and for that I'm truly grateful. Because of Indra, I have a much greater awareness of her journey as a mother, daughter, wife, global leader, and really how to be grounded and not get high on your own supply. I'm, I, I feel I'm a better advocate for women because of Indra, so thank you. I ask myself invariably, what would Indra do in many situations? I know the answer is put your head down, stay out of politics, and work hard. Reshma Sajani. She's a leading activist and founder of Girls Who Code and the Marshall Plan for Moms, which I think, again, all of you have a copy of the book. She's the author of Pay Up, The Future of Women in Work, and Why It's Different Than You Think. And hopefully we're going to start a dialogue about those issues today. Russia has spent more than a decade building movements to fight for women and girls' economic empowerment, working to close the gender gap in the tech sector, and most recently advocating for policies to support moms impacted by the pandemic. Reshma is also the author of the international bestseller, Brave, Not Perfect, and her influential TED Talk, Teach Girls, Bravery, Not Perfection, has more than five million views globally. Reshma lives in New York City with her husband, Nahal, their sons, Sean and Sai, and their bulldog, Stanley. I first met Reshma in 2009, 2010, when she was running for Congress, uh, and uh, and V, actually, my cousin Maitri, and, my fo and our former CEO, John Mack, who is a big supporter. I've watched and supported Reshma in her run for Congress and then for public advocate. She supported me when I was looking at positions in US Treasury, and I'm honored to call her and her husband Nahal friends. I learned from her, and with pay up, she makes me think of how I can be a better supporter to women, as I thought I was doing a pretty good job. And uh, because of that, and because of uh, kind of really the call to arms that the book is. Um, I hope all of us become better partners. I know my goal is to be a better partner and supporter to my women colleagues, to mentees, to my daughter, to my ex-wife, and to my fiance, who are all professionals, and hopefully more accepting of the powerful choice to stay home and care for kids in the household, which I got a small taste of over the last couple of years <laughs> during COVID as a single parent part of the time. Uh, Reshma was so gracious to speak to uh, my kids' school last week um, during their assembly. And I know it was very empowering for uh, the school and um, embarrassing for my children. <laughs> and, and finally, Seema Modi. Uh, Seema is a global markets reporter for CNBC, focusing on the intersection of foreign policy and Wall Street. Her career in journalism has afforded her the opportunity to work in Mumbai, 
and London as the European correspondent. I met Seema a few years ago via mutual friends and continue to learn from her. I'm really excited about the new project she's working on and happy to have her participate in panels such as this and wherever we can have her in the Asian community and elsewhere. With that, Indra, Reshma, Seema, please join the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? It is such a pleasure to sit down here uh, with Indra and Reshma. Thank you. I've really enjoyed both of your books in which you lay out in different ways a convincing argument around paid leave, uh, the need for work flexibility. And I'm just curious, Indra, your book came out in late September of 2021. You've been on this international book tour, recently coming back from Dubai. What has the conversation been like with women, their response to some of the policies you hope are unveiled over time? You know, what's surprising is that all the women believe that this is no longer a subject that should be discussed. We just need to move to action. That is not a political issue, it's a human issue. Surprisingly, the men also agree it's a human issue and should be addressed. But nobody wants to move it from uh, sort of thought to action. They all agree it's a big issue, but money stands in the way. So um, if you're a small and medium-sized enterprise, they go, how are we going to provide paid leave? How are we going to provide flexible work? And childcare, forget it, OK? Big companies go, well, we know we have to think about it, but isn't that the problem of the family? Why should we get involved in family? So uh, I don't know where to begin to solve this, because I've never seen an issue where everybody is in agreement, but nobody wants to act on it in a systematic way. I don't know, Reshma, you might have a better perspective. <laughs> Um, no, I think that's absolutely right. I think that, I also think in the right, we've been kind of focused on women's empowerment in a particular way. Um, you know, I talk about this in my book. You know, I spent the past 10 years telling Girls Who Code to, you know, barnstorm the corner office and lean in real hard and girl boss their way to the top. And during the pandemic, I found myself with two little kids, you know, I had a newborn baby, a six-year-old. Yeah, and I was trying to save Girls Who Code from being shut down, and it, it nearly broke me. And I have support. And so I think I learned the hard way that having it all is just a euphemism for doing it all. And so much of the way that we've been trying to get to equality is like, go color code your calendar. Find a mentor. Get a sponsor. It's all about be fixing the woman instead of fixing the structure. And I think what Indra and I are talking about is kind of revolutionary. And it's, 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 it's a mind shift. And so how do you kind of shift a boulder, both in, and we're seeing in government's not working, right? Those men rather bail out airlines rather than bail out moms. You know, even in the largest exodus of women leaving the workforce in the history of our nation, uh, the, the greatest resignation where you have so many open jobs, they still can't pass paid leave and affordable childcare, even though, again, 51% of the voting population is female. So I think you're right. I mean, I have some ideas on how we do it, but I, I think we need to understand that it, it is a seismic shift of, of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting. This morning, I was doing a talk for a company in India, and they asked me this question, which, and the answer surprised them. They said, you know, we lived in those days when there was multi-generational families, and everybody was taken care of. Kids were happy. The elders were happy. What went wrong in society? What went wrong in society is those days, women did unpaid work yeah. and worked from morning to night. They were not treated well, never complimented, and they were lifelong unpaid laborers. Think about it. The men would retire and sit in the patio with their feet up and you know, sort of snap their fingers and food would show up. The woman was a lifelong laborer. And all of a sudden, women are saying, hey, wait a minute. We have hopes, dreams, and aspirations. We've been educated. We want to have economic freedom. We want power of the purse. And all of a sudden, people are going, you mean we have to pay for the service? Yeah. And they keep saying, why should we pay too much? Because they're comparing the wages with the unpaid laborer's wage. That's right. And so we have to make society rethink this whole thing. You know, just to add to this, too, I think that where we're in this moment, I had an a Instagram a DM message from a woman. She's a midwife. Mm -hmm. And she lives in a state where if there is one um, COVID case in a daycare, the entire daycare shuts down. So she says, like, in my hospital now, this is my fifth absence. And so my employer basically said to me, one more absence and you're fired. 
And she said, well, what do, what do I do? Because, again, I live in a state where the, my daycare is shutting down. I have a three-year-old. I have no other options. Mothers, ironically, you may not know this, are not a protected class in the workforce. So she doesn't even have a legal claim against this hospital for firing her for not showing up because her child's daycare center is shut down. So, so these are things, again, because half of America's daycare centers are shut down, because we are constantly living with this threat of the variant, because 51% of mothers report that they're anxious and depressed, the largest subgroup in the country that is suffering from the pandemic are moms. And going back to your point about India, we never broke. We just kept doing the unpaid labor, kept doing our full-time jobs, just kept, 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 kept going. And I think we can't go anymore. This is a great point. I mean, do you think, Indra, there is a reality check that our diaspora here in America uh, needs to confront the pressures that we put on Indian, Asian women to survive and to ensure that they're not only the best at their careers, but they're also the best at being a mom and, and a daughter-in-law, something that you talk about a lot in your book. Well, right now, don't even go to best, just hold on to the job. Because I tell you, families are fragile. Anybody who thinks a family is not fragile and is going to be perfect and together forever, guess again. M most families are fragile, families are not perfect. And when families go through fragility, the person that hurts the most is the woman. Because there aren't enough support mechanisms and protection mechanisms for women. So we have a situation where a woman may be highly educated, is perfectly capable of going out and making a living for herself, but gives it all up for the guy. And I live in a town where, you know, through COVID, there's been a lot of domestic violence and a lot of divorce. And one of the common refrains I hear is that the woman quits her job and she uh, gets married because she's marrying somebody fairly wealthy. Uh, when the kids leave the home at high school, the husband tells her, I always think of you as a mother of my kids, not as my wife. And then there's a divorce. Never heard of this. What is this woman supposed to do right. in that situation? Right. And so I sit there going, I'm making an argument both as a feminist and as an economist. Women are supremely talented and they're needed for the workforce. But as a feminist, I'd also say that women need to have the power of the purse yeah. because they should not be absolutely prisoner to somebody else and putting their hand out to a guy and say, give me money. Yep. That's not how it should be. Absolutely not. Rishma, what is your advice? We're sitting alongside a number of prominent Asian leaders here in the city, a city that is considered the most ambitious at yet here in the world, really. And yet, a lot of women still feel like they're carrying that weight, the pressure of their parents to succeed and be great at what they do, but also be a great mom. How do you balance both the professional and personal challenges? I mean, I think that those are the kinds of words we have to throw in the garbage. Um, you know, par part of I think it's important, I feel like we've all jumped into this topic without taking like a minute to like step back and be like, okay, what are you guys all talking about? Um, so I just want to put context uh, for a minute. Um, you know, so basically at the beginning of COVID, 51% of the labor force is female. Uh, for the past 20 to 30 years, uh, women have been 57% of bachelor's degrees. Uh, the majority of PhDs, the majority of masters, every single way you measure success, it has actually been women who have been outperforming men, not just for the past five years, but for the past 30 years, 40 years. Now you kind of look at the top of power. Uh, use Congress as an example. Use Wall Street as an example. Indra, right, you're like, you know, a unicorn, you know, in terms of being, you know, a woman who is a mother, who is a daughter-in-law, who, you know, in, is at the top slot, right? And so oftentimes, you know, we're taking a step back and saying, well, wait, what, where does the drop off happen? Why is it happening? Again, our solution to that was to fix women. Well, the reason we're all not becoming in their noise is because we're just not raising our hand enough. We're just brave, you know, we're just perfect, not brave. You know, we just, you just, if you had a sponsor, you'd make it to the top. And then COVID happens. And I think what you basically start seeing is, oh, it's not about equality. It's not, we're not getting to equality. We're not not getting to equality because we're not trying hard enough. We're not getting to equality because before we even stepped into the work phase, we have two and a half jobs. Two thirds of caretaking work is done by women. 
United States is the only nation that we're the only uh, uh, industrialized nation that doesn't offer paid leave. So 85% of women go back to the workforce 10 days after having a child. Uh, in this country, more people pay more for their more for their childcare than they pay for their mortgage. The United States, the average family gets $500 to put towards their childcare. In most developed nations, it's 15,000. Right? We are the only nation that doesn't have a parental allowance. In most nations like Germany, France, even now India, when you have a child, you get a check from the government to basically pay for your unpaid labor. COVID happens. Through the past two, two years, almost 11 million women leave the workforce. Again, we go from 51% of the labor force in the United States to back where we were in 1989. You lose millions of jobs. The current you know, jobs report that came out last week shows that men are entering the workforce at 27 times that of men. We are still missing 1.1 million women. That doesn't account for the amount of women who downshifted their careers, who said, ah, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm an engineer, I'm gonna do some consulting now, right? Again, if you look at our peers, England, Canada, France, I almost started crying. I talked to the uh, Canadian Prime Minister, basically. They're like, basically, what are you talking about, Rashma? We've had the largest bull market of women post-COVID ever. In every other nation, there are more women in the labor market because why? They have paid leave. They have affordable childcare. They have the parental income. So what this teaches us over the past two years is that it's the structures that matter. The reason why we will never get to equality in our country is because we don't have adequate structure of care. So is that the solution, Indra, following the steps of Canada, France, that have these childcare programs in place, or is there another solution at hand? I think it's got to start with the recognition that <clears throat> you need women in the workforce in order to grow the GDP. You're not doing women a favor by putting in place paid leave and childcare. You're doing it because we are short of people to do the big jobs. If you want the best and the brightest, you have to make sure women come into the workforce for the very reason that Reshma articulated. Notwithstanding the fact that 70% of high school valedictorians are women. The question is, you know, I said on the board of MIT, 47% of uh, graduating engineers are MIT, from, are women. 2.3% of venture capital funding is given to women. Why? Yeah. I mean, I think we should start thinking like business people and economists and say, we need that talent in the workforce, okay? And how are we gonna bring that talent into the workforce? The investment in childcare or paid leave is minuscule compared to the contributions they're gonna to make to the workforce, first point. Point number two, if you don't provide these services, women are gonna delay having children they're not going to have children at all. And the industry that's growing fastest, as you all know, is the egg freezing industry. OK, you can keep growing the egg freezing industry, but if nobody's going to have kids, that's going to be a lot of eggs in the bank. Mm -hmm. And so I think we really have to come to terms with the fact that if we don't have young people, we can't pay into the pension plans to support the older people. Nobody's going to be around to take care of the older people. So. Our birth rate is already coming down to 1.6 to 1.7. We need to be at 2.1. And all that we have to do is look at Japan and South Korea and say, we have a demographic problem if we don't encourage families to have children. And the only way to do it is providing support systems for women because we also need them in the workforce. The final point, uh, uh, Seema and Reshma, is that as I look over the next five to 10 years, the most number of jobs that are going to require human intervention are some sort of a care job. Childcare, senior care, nursing, doctors, it's the care economy, where women are overrepresented, as Reshma just said. So if we don't find a way to bring women into the workforce by caring for the caregivers, caring for the caregivers' children, what we're gonna end up with is a senior population, and you know there are 10,000 of us turning 65 every uh, day, a senior population with nobody to take care of them, and not enough children coming in to the population. That's not gonna be a pretty picture at all. So it's a moment of reckoning. Yeah. It's really interesting. Reshma, the central question around, in the initiatives around care, is it solely the responsibility of Washington, or what is the role of corporate America in no, your opinion? No, I mean, I, I think we can't wait for Congress to grow a heart. 
Um, and, and so I think that they are, we can't wait for them to get anything done. And, and, and I feel bad for a lot of us as activists, we've just been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And, and so what we've really turned at my organization, Marshall Plan for Moms, is to the private sector. Uh, we have a report that we're releasing in a couple of weeks with McKinsey about making the business case for childcare and launching a national business childcare coalition. So right now, you know, so this is one of, I think, I, I think this is one of the ways you get it done is through what Inder's been talking about is, is the private sector. I think the private sector understands it in a way they didn't before because there's these 11 million open jobs and they're so desperate for talent. And because no one's going to the office, they have an extra $10,000 per person that they're not spending on snacks and food, um, seriously, to basically invest in, in, in benefits. So we're launching a national business child care coalition to get companies to start subsidizing child care. So right now, 10% of companies offer some form of childcare. That might be a cash payment. That might be backup care. Uh, you know, that might be a loan. Um, it might be building a, a daycare center on site. You know, how do we start getting uh, childcare to basically be like healthcare? You wouldn't work for a company that wasn't supporting. You know, you're we're paying for some form of your healthcare. And you know, we have an incredible amount of companies, big companies. Um, that are really signed up. And also, to Indra's point too, small companies. Because we know that the tech companies are going to do all that stuff, right? It's not about them. It's about getting to make sure that if you're a retail worker working in Walmart or working, you know, at Helmet Lang, you know, or Target, that basically you're going to get a cash subsidy to start paying for your child care. And that's where, that's where we see things shifting and I think where, where the future is. Indra, when you look at corporate America, to get corporations to prioritize child care, is it the responsibility of the CEO, the C-suite, or is it the responsibility of the board? You sit on a number of boards to hold those CEOs accountable. I don't think this is a board topic. It's a CEO, the human resources, the senior executives who've got to say, look, we can't hire the people we need because we don't have the support structures for them to come to work and have families, both men and women. I mean, let's not make it just a female issue because all this time we've said family is female. Family is not just female. Family is male and female. So uh, we've got to let men talk about families too. And, you know, when we put on-site childcare in PepsiCo in the headquarters, men brought their kids as much as women did. So this is a genderless issue. It's a family issue. I think CEOs have to grow a heart, as Reshma said. She talked about politics, but CEOs have to grow a heart and say, employees who come into work in our companies are not just tools of the trade, they're real talent. And in order for me to hold on to them, I've got to make sure that I recognize that they come with the family behind them. In fact, I want them to come with the family behind them because that's good for society, good for the future, and makes them better people when they have families behind them. So in the future of work discussions, we have to move from family being fringe and irrelevant to the discussion to make it the core of the discussion of the future of work. Today, when we talk about future of work, we talk about robotics, automation. We talk about all that. Nobody talks about the role of family in the future of work. That's right. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just s simple things. Like, why is the work day 9 to 5 and the school day is 8 to 3? Like, doesn't make sense, you know? And, you know, I think so much, it's, it's, I find it so fascinating, and I understand it from New York City, a real estate issue of like, why are we pushing so hard to return back to the old normal? And when you think about the old normal, it wasn't working for parents. It wasn't working for people of color. The amount of, you know, black and brown people have like, can I not go to work and have somebody ask me about my hair? You know, it wasn't working for non-binary. It wasn't, it wasn't working for anyone. And there are pieces of it, right? Core collaboration, spending time in the office, but we can actually use a, take a minute to reflect and to, and to shift. And I think what Indra is saying is so, so right. I think about my own parents. You know, my, both of my parents worked at the same company for 40 years. And, you know, their, their bosses knew my name where I went to school. We used to look forward to like the family office picnics. You know, they would set aside, you know, the chocolate chip cookies that I liked. I mean, it was about family. And when you knew that somebody cared about you, you stayed. And, you know, the other you know, piece we're arguing in our, in our report that we're doing with McKinsey is that the cost of attrition is actually higher than the cost of childcare. Because you don't care about me, I'm not staying with you all that long. And I'm leaving to the next place. And so we have to, and I do think that the pandemic taught us, it's, like, it's not that people don't want to work. They don't want to work for you. 
Indra, in your book, you talk about destigmatizing the perception of a working mom. In 2022, we're still talking about changing that perception, that being a good thing. Uh, from the conversations you're having with CEOs, is it changing, and how do we do it? You know, it's, it's unfortunate. I think it's changing. That's the good news. But it's unfortunate that if you have a working mom who especially ascends to senior positions, the assumption is that you're divorced or your kids are messed up or you don't have kids or I don't know what they're thinking, but it's always like you, something must be wrong. How could you be married and have kids? And that's, you know, they're asking questions which basically hinted that. And then you start getting defensive saying, no, I'm really married. I'm actually in a stable marriage, believe it or not. And guess what? I have two kids, they're okay. And it's like, how is it possible? Because the model they have in mind was, you know, the ideal worker is the male that comes to work and the ideal support structure at home is the woman that stays at home. And when you are in a senior position in a company, you must be, uh, what is it, uh, uh, a woman who's really a man kind of a thing. So you're fighting those stereotypes and you're making excuses for that. I took the opposite point of view. At 5 o'clock on the dot, I told my kids, you can come to work. So from school, they would just come home, come to the office and run around the corridors. Because 5 o'clock, I said, you know, the work day is over, especially when I was more junior in the company. Uh, work day is over. It's, it's fair game for the kids to come to the office. And they would wander around to offices and go to, you know, Roger Enrico was CEO there. I remember my little one walking into his office and saying, Mr. Enrico, do you have anything to do or can I sit and chat with you? And he'd say, you can sit down and chat with me, but what are we going to talk about? She says, mom's busy, so I thought I'll come chat with you. <laughs> so my point is, after 5 p.m. it was fair game. But uh, there was always a perception that we women were not doing a good job as moms. And uh, you always felt a little uncomfortable that uh, you were failing as a mom. And, you know, when you have daughters, they remind you constantly that you're failing as a mom. <laughs> that you put the knife in and turn it in you. Uh, I go through it even today, even though my kids are grown up. Uh, so ev society reminds you, people at work remind you, your kids remind you, your daughters remind you. The question is, how do you remain sane through all of this? Mm -hmm. That's the real thing. Rishma, you had a huge impact on my life. Something. Uh, that I'm sure you realize had a profound impact was Failure Fridays. Something on social media, maybe you can share with everyone here, sort of fighting this perception that we as women can be perfect and not even strive to be so because it's part of life. Yeah, I, mean, I think what you're what you're talking about in there too is like we have so much shame and we think we're the only ones screwing it up and everybody else has got it, you know, on perfectly. And I think Instagram is an example of that. You know, I think about our family vacations. It's like everybody's fighting. Nobody wants to have dinner together. Somebody's crying. But then you see on the photo, everybody's in matching outfits with just a huge smile. And you're like, oh, my God, what's wrong with me? Like, so I think we have to just start telling the truth. I think, I think what you're saying is so powerful, too, because part of what, um, part of what it, the problem is with working moms is the, is the judgment and the shame that we have. Uh, I was talking to a woman the other day. She was on a legal call with a judge and another lawyer. And the judge says, I got to end this call by three because my dog's sick and I got to take him to the doctor. And the other guy's like, great, because at four o'clock I got to go pick up the kids from soccer. And she's staring at them like, I cannot believe this shit. Because if I had said, I have to leave at three to go pick up the kids, they would have rolled their eyes. And maybe they would and maybe they wouldn't. And maybe she just thinks that they would. And that's what we have to actually change, which is really this idea of like parenting out loud. But I think to Indra's point, it's not just about perception. It's true. One of the things that frustrates me so much is this conversation about pay equity. So the reality is, you know, you saw the, the women's soccer team go to the White House and celebrate. That's not pay equity, inequity. There's actually, it's, the, the pay gap is not between women and men. The pay gap is between mothers and fathers. And actually the largest pay gap is between childless women and mothers. We don't discriminate against women. We don't even discriminate against care workers because when men become fathers, they make more money. We just discriminate against mothers. And, and, and so getting, again, very specific about the data. I mean, the, the article just came out last week that women are now making, millennial women, i.e. childless women, are making more money than men in 22 states. So if we don't... And in New York City. And in New York City. But if we're not focused on the, the, the type of discrimination we're talking about, 
male CEOs will see that article and be like, what are you guys talking about? There's no gender gap anymore. We're make, women are making more. No, 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 no. Which women? And so we have to be, again, very, very, very specific because this is what, what you talked about is so critical. Like, yes, women are 70% of valedictorians and 56% of bachelor's degree. And now at MIT, 51% or, or 47% of all computer science graduates. But the reality is, is 50% of women in tech leave by the time they're 35 when they have a kid. Not because they want to spend time with them. Trust me. You listen to us. <laughs> right? But because everything changes. And part of it, perhaps, is also gaining more internal support and people understanding these, the gap and the issue at stake. In your book, Indra, you, you sort of highlight some of the individuals that played a key role in advocating for you, some of them in your professional role like Gerard and then the former CEO of Pepsi Wayne. How do individuals in this room create those advocates around them as they sort of climb the corporate ladder? Mm. But before I answer that question, I just want to say, I feel great about the future because I look at Reshma and people like her, and I go, we're all in good hands. This is a pistol. <laughs> really, I tell you, Reshma, you're amazing. <laughs> Truly amazing. You know, we are all yesterday's story, but this is tomorrow's story. Today's story is Reshma Sujani. So thank you for everything you do with Girls Who Code, this Marshall Plan for Women. It's just fantastic, Reshma. And the way you talk about it is so passionate. I'm sitting like a proud mother looking at you saying, your mom did good by you. Your parents. Your mom. Uh, let's talk about mentors. And all my life, I've had phenomenal mentors. I mean, really, who pushed me, pulled me, supported me. Uh, you know, my boss, Steve Reinemann, before I became CEO, um, you know, my husband was in India taking care of his father who was dying. And I had one kid in boarding school, one kid in Sacred Heart near the house. And if there was a problem in one of the two places, Steve would say, you go take care of one of the kids, I'll go pick up the other kid. And I'll take her home and my wife will take care of them and, you know, when you return, I'll return the kid to you. So I had a CEO who believed that it shouldn't matter if she works for me or not. She's got a problem. I have kids too, so I've got to help. So if I stood at his door and just peeped in, he knew I had to discuss something with him personal. He would just throw whoever was in his office out and say, Indra, tell me what's up. So I was surrounded by men who supported me in such profound ways. I wouldn't be here today without them. Okay, so let me tell you one thing though. They pick you, you can't pick them. I don't believe I've gone to anybody and said, will you be my mentor? I didn't even know some of them were my mentors. And they pick you because they see something in you that they feel good about, and they want to be part of your success and to be able to say, you know, I had a part in her success. Uh, you know, she became CEO, but I'm one of the people that coached and developed her. They want to say that. So if you go to somebody and say, will you be my mentor? I don't know if they know what to do. I get maybe a letter a day from people asking me to be their mentor. I don't know what to do. Okay, so be very careful in thinking that mentorship is somebody you pluck out of a uh, phone book or a uh, LinkedIn and say, will you be my mentor? It's people around you, people who see you in action, who advise you, push you, uh, critique you a lot. Because all my mentors have given me tough advice and I've taken it. And mentorship is a two-way street. If they give you advice and you don't take it, go back and tell them why you didn't take it. Because the next time they come to give, when you go to ask for advice, they'll say, I'm not going to give it to you because you don't take it anyway. So mentorship is a two-way street. And when you think somebody's mentoring you, be respectful and be thankful for that. You can get advice from a lot of people, but a true mentor, very, very hard to get. Very hard to get. Reshma, organically creating uh, a relationship with someone who can then become your mentor. How would you say you do it? No, I, I think everything you're saying is right. I just also want to take a second, because I think, Simi, I can speak for both of us. We just followed your career our whole lives. Read every, right? How many of us read every little piece? And I even remember this one article I read about you. I think you had worn a sari to work, and you were singing... Or you were, you know, again, singing a, an Indian song or something. But I was like, am I reading this in Fortune no, that, or that's just, that, that's, Do you remember? It's totally wrong. Because yeah. I never wore a sari to work. <laughs> never wore a sari to work. <laughs> this is the part about the media that completely freaks me out. Because they make, up I've, they make it up. I've never worn a sari to work. And after 5 o'clock, 
my feet would be hurting with these heels. <laughs> so I'd kick off my shoes, and when I went to the coffee machine or something, I'd be humming a tune. And so they wrote this piece which said, this new CEO is an immigrant from India. She wears saris to work, walks bare feet, and goes around singing. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Okay. <laughs> that, was, that was the image they created about me, and I'm like, who is this person they're talking about? But you know what's interesting, though? From this side of it, I was like, badass. Right? From my yeah. side of it, as a young woman, seeing someone that can authentically just be, I was like, wow, she just doesn't care about any, and she is the, you know, so I think uh, it's also, okay. like, in so I'm sorry to disappoint yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then the funny part is, I used to wear scarves. People didn't know how to connect the sari to what I was wearing. I was wearing a business suit. So they'd come and say, is this the sari? <laughs> And they touch my scarf and I go, it's a scarf, you nut. It's just a scarf. <laughs> but you see, they, they couldn't tie the sari with this person showing up in a black, you know, dress. Well, I, don't, I think they couldn't get it together. They couldn't understand, right? They couldn't, they wanted, they needed to put it into a box. But I feel like from our perspective, you lived and led authentically, yeah. which I think As is really important for us As a summer intern, I had no see. money, so I wore a sari, but yeah. not when I had some bucks to buy a dress. <laughs> 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 But I think Rish was right as the 15th woman to lead a Fortune 500 company. On top of that, being a woman of color and an mother. immigrant, taking over an iconic, iconic U.S. consumer company. People had this curiosity that you talk about in your book. They wanted to understand some of those cultural differences, what you're bringing to the table. How did you do that, by the way, to make that an asset and something that only made you stronger, your cultural upbringing, versus something that could be seen yeah, I get the differently. That you were wearing whatever the outfit you were supposed to wear and behaving how you... I, I really did feel like you were being you. Yeah. And, and Oh, it, let me tell you how I was being me. Yeah. Because I, I didn't know how to shop. No. See, today you have all these people who help you shop. In my early days, I didn't know how to shop for clothes. So I, my jacket was always two sizes too big for me because my mother would always say you'd grow into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little realizing that I was fully grown. So if I look at some of the pictures from my early days, they're ghastly. So can you imagine, in walks this person of color, woman, immigrant from an emerging market, walks into the boardroom with all men in this pretty ghastly uh, suit, uh, in retrospect, but those days I thought it was pretty spiffy. I walk in there, and sometimes in my early days as a consultant, I didn't have much money, so I'd have two suits, I'd mix and match them. Um, sometimes the hem would fall off, and I'd stick it up with scotch tape. But scotch tape on wool falls off after a while. And I'd be giving a presentation, I'm f feeling the hem fall off. <laughs> and I'm going, what do I do? Do I excuse myself and go fix the hem? Or should I just continue? After a while, I said, screw it. So my hem has fallen off. So you guys might think I've got a skirt with the hem. But I'm going to wow you with my content. So I decided that I was going to substitute brains for looks. So I said, forget the fact I look god awful. When I speak, it's going to be useful. So I over prepared. I read everything that was put in front of me. I might have been the only person in the room that read all the material. Because most of the others, which were all men, perhaps read one or two sections to just make one or two points to look intelligent. I read everything cover to cover. So I came over prepared and I overcame all my handicaps, the way I looked and dressed with you know, what I contributed to the meeting. And that's how I overcame all of the uh, horrible things that I brought to the table in terms of the looks. But it was pretty bad. You also did your market research. You would take field trips to different grocery oh, stores yeah. to That's understand all part of the, the American part, building, building an arsenal of skills so nobody noticed what I looked like or how I dressed. And I'm serious. Today, you've got a lot of help, and all of you look spectacular. But at your stage in career, where the way I dressed left a lot to be desired. In fact, I talk about in the book that we had a young designer who was working with us in Gatorade, an outside consultant. I don't even know how he had the courage to come to the CEO and say, I'd like to talk to you. He asked to talk to me and he said, I think I could improve how you look and dress. I said, you know, who the hell are you? Young consultant, <laughs> outside guy working on Gatorade. He said, if you came and met me at the Saks Fifth Avenue Club in New York on a Saturday, on a Saturday morning, 
I can tell you how you might change your appearance. I'd never been to Saks Fifth Avenue till then. So I met him at Saks Fifth Avenue Club in New York, and in the biggest room in the Fifth Avenue Club, he had ar arranged maybe 25 different outfits, but put everything together, shoes, bags, jewelry. I owned two bags until then. It, some of it was frayed, but I didn't care. The bag was not important to me. And I never had jewelry that matched clothes, never. Shoes, I had about two or three pairs, the heels were scuffed, I didn't care. And this guy says, um, you wear skirts up to your ankle, looks awful. We're going to get you short, skirt, short uh, dresses, shorter dresses. I said, I'm not going to show my legs. He said, give it, a, give it a try. And Gordon, this, this consultant, taught me how to dress. He prepared a lookbook for me. How to mix and match all the outfits I bought with everything else I bought. And I still have it with me. Uh, he taught me how to dress. Till then, it, nobody else had ever intervened and said, let's give this person a hand and you know, sort of change her up. So another mentor, see this? Yeah. It's amazing. It, you know, aside from that, it, it, you also, both of you talk about in your book, the importance of learning how to narrate, be a great speaker, something that, anecdotally speaking, from the research that shows, Asian women sometimes struggle with that. How did you break from that mold, Reshma. Oh, God, I'd love find to Find a way to succeed. I loved a mic ever since I was like 10. Yeah. Uh, it's true, right? I, I looked for every opportunity to public speak ever since I was little. Um, and I would just, I say that to young people right now. Um, and I prepared, yep. you know? And I think part of what, I, right now I'm, 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 I'm the commencement speaker at Yale, and I've been working on my speech for six months now. Um, but... But being again very thoughtful about high risk, high, high, risk, high, 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 high it's, yeah, it's stressful, um, to, to say the least. Right, but right, jokes or, or you're taking people through kind of this emotional arc of of telling a story. Um, but you're right; it wasn't something that you learn in your by immigrant Indian family. You know how to do no. In fact, I think in our culture, you're, you're really more taught to make yourself small and you know not call attention to yourself. And, and so, but I just always, I, I always loved it, and I always enjoyed, enjoyed it. And there a debate team that played a role yeah, for you. I think being on a debating team from the yeah. time you're in middle school, yeah. high school makes all the difference in the world. Me, me too, I was on debating. Yeah. yeah, and you know what? Encourage your kids to get on debating teams. And if you've come to this point now and you're still hesitant about addressing large groups, go take a course on how to do that, how to tell stories, how to inject humor, uh, you know, how to. Present yourself so that people notice you for the message, not notice you for yourself. Uh, and I think it's worth investing your time in great communication skills. That's right. And the other thing I learned is like, well, you know, Indra and I have probably told the stories that we're telling a hundred, two hundred times. So in many ways, like when you're a public speaker, it's like you're a comedian. You're perfecting a joke, and you're thinking about all of the arcs and the moments and the pauses. It's a skill that you have to basically practice over and over and over again. But it's an important one, whether you're on a panel or in a, you know, in a boardroom. And I think also, I used to always memorize my speeches, tuck them in the back, of, and then just say them, and I sounded like a robot. Yeah. And so that's why I say to women and men, you know, when you're in a meeting and it's time for, anyone have any questions, just raise your hand. Get into the habit of just impromptu speaking and saying what's on your mind because then it won't frighten you to do that later. Such great advice. We're approaching the time where we're going to open it up for Q&A, so get your questions ready. But before we get there, one piece of advice you want to give Asian Americans who are in this room to succeed. You know, I think as a group, Asian Americans are wicked smart and have enormous talents that you bring to the workforce. Women, Asian Americans, all of us. Uh, and so, if you look forward and look at the fact that we have an acute talent shortage, it should be the decades where the talents of all of you are highly prized in the corporate world, or whatever world it is. So you have to have that basic confidence that you have a rightful place in society as opposed to, do I belong? Do I have a place here? Don't even have those doubts. You do have a place in society. My one piece of advice, Draw attention to your competence. Don't draw attention to who you are. Mm. Who you are should be relevant. Draw attention to your competence. Um, I'm not suggesting you dress like a man, but don't dress with too much jewelry, you know. 
orange and uh, you know purple streaks in your hair. People say that's all individuality. I accept individuality in your private life. When you come to work, draw attention to what you're going to be saying. Because that's what you want to be known for, your contributions. You don't want people to go out there and say, who's that woman? Or who was that orange-haired person? Or that person with a lot of jewelry that was clinging? You don't want to say that. You want to say, who's that person who made those great points about this particular topic? Draw attention to what you want to contribute. I know it's not the most popular piece of advice, but that's my earnest piece of advice from an older person. Now, Reshma will give you the point of view from a more relevant, younger person. Um, I think the advice that I would give is, you know, we were all taught to, you know, my father would say, you have three choices, be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. And I think we were all taught to play it safe. And, you know, when I ran for office the first time, at con uh, convention mentioned I lost all my elections. Uh, I'm very good at losing political elections. Uh, but, you know, my parents are very terrified because you don't put yourself out there and basically solicit failure. And I think the biggest gift I would say to you is find ways to fail. Our friend Falu is here who just, you know, won a, a Grammy. Give her a huge round of applause. We were talking about this because um, it was the second time you were nominated. And in many ways, when the first time doesn't work out, you enjoy it even better. You know, I love Serena Williams. And you think about Serena or any competitive athlete, and they sit at the edge of their, their ability in a coach who says, do it again, do it again, do it again. The only way you become great is if you do it again and again and again. And so failure is a gift. So definitely solicit it. And to have that perseverance, to keep pushing yeah. as well. Love it. Great advice. Kamesh, you want to take over? Great. I think we're going to do Q&A. Um, stand again. Um, let's, uh, let's get as many questions as we can. So whoever wants to stand up, we can, we can come up and get a mic, or uh, we can bring it to you. This is so beautiful. Thank you for advising and guiding us through your journey. As an entertainer, I am the only South Asian this year at the Grammys to win. And they made me perform. And I started the Grammys. I opened it. And I closed it with the win. What message can we, you give us people who are not lawyers, who are not doctors, who have to make their own road to success because there is none that I could follow. I failed so many times and I kept going. And I want to understand if there is something that entertainers who have no job security, we don't know if you're going to get a first, second paycheck because it's all of our careers are all how well we do and perform. So what is the advice that you would give to people who are in, in different careers like mine? I mean, I, I think, f I, I don't know what to give you about job security advice. <laughs> but I do think what I would say is that I think all, of, all three of us, four of us, actually have all been the only and the first. And in, in different, right? In for you in entertainment, for in their own business, for me in, in, in politics, for you in, in media. And so I think we all know a piece of what you're saying and, and what that feels like. I feel like for me, what gives me gratitude is to share that information back. There's probably some South Asian performer in entertainment who's like, how do I get in this room? What do I learn? How, what do, how, do, how, do, how did you do it? And I think giving that back you know what I mean? And finding ways, I think, to share information and knowledge. I, I also think it's what, what, what Inder just said earlier, too. Just believe in your talent. You are the best follow I've ever met. You are. You're incredible. You've always been. First time I saw you, I was 19 years old in a, you know, in a, in, in, in a, right, very funny, in a theater in Boston. And so, you know, this skill that you have, this gift that you have from God is timeless. Great. Okay. Oh. Question there. Thank Got you so much for your presentation. Very inspiring. And one question that I have is like, I believe strongly in the numbers. And if we look, uh, I always quote corporate America. If we look at the percentage of female CEOs, we have less than 10%, 8% are female, which means that 92% are men. There isn't even one Latina. 
currently uh, CEO. So, you know, there hasn't been much progress, frankly. And I think if we leave it to corporate America, we, we know that because it's controlled by men, primarily white men, or if we leave it to politics, which is also controlled by men, we haven't even had a female president in this country, you know, I don't know if it's going to move. So I always think that we need to empower consumers and voters because, you know, the wallet talk and the votes talk. So how can we mobilize women and also men that support this movement because it's not only women, we need to have also the support of men and be able to really make the change that we need because there's so much talk and so little change. So we need to make something, something is not working. We need to make uh, changes that really are gonna bring the power that, that we need. You know, from talking about having uh, support for childcare at the work, you know, at work in Chile, for example, which is a much underdeveloped country than the US, is mandatory by law if you have more than 21 um, people in your company, you must have it. So it's, it, it works, so it, it should be implemented, but we need to make the change happen. Thank you. Um, Reshma, I'll take a shot at it, then you can. First of all, I agree with all your numbers, but I have news for you. The numbers in the US, which we'd like to see improved, is still among the best in the world. So relative to every country out there, the US is doing pretty, pretty well, okay? So we have to first acknowledge that. Um, there's a story I mentioned in the book, I think uh, a decade or so ago, maybe more than that, I was in uh, the UK having lunch with one of the prime ministers in Chequers, and he looked at me and said, Indra, when you went to the US many years ago, why didn't you come here to England to study? I said, because had I come here, Mr. Prime Minister, I wouldn't be having lunch with you. And I mean that, because my story could have been possible only in the United States. So for all the things that we want to see improved in the US, we're still pretty damn good on a relative basis, on a relative basis. Uh, but things have to change. But I want to explain some of the maths to you. I'll use PepsiCo as an example. Think of the pyramid. The pyramid is very, very steep, you know, because it's a pyramid. At the entry level, there's about 15,000 people. By the time you get to a CEO minus one, there's only 15 people, and one person becomes a CEO. So it's one out of 1,000 people, one for every 1,000, reaching the tippy top, and then one person becoming the CEO. If you don't have at least half those 15 people be women eligible to be CEO, you're not going to get a CEO who's woman. But in order to get people up there in the second and third level of the company, you've got to keep them in the job and allow them to grow in the company. And that's where we have all the attrition. By the time you get to the third level, you've got a lot of women who have left the workforce because they don't have the kind of support mechanisms which allows them to have a family and stay in the job. As I've always said, the biological clock and the career clock are in conflict with each other. So if we want more women CEOs, you can't just helicopter them into the top. You've got to create them. And if we don't put in the support systems we're talking about, we're going to be having the same conversation in 20 years. And it'll be the same statistics, the same attrition issues, and maybe we would have gone from 8% of the Fortune 500 being women CEOs to 9%, and we'd be celebrating that we've improved it by one whole point in 20 years. I'm afraid we need to fix the pipeline, not the top. Yeah, did everyone understand that and let that sink in? Like how 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 like profoundly critical what she what Indra is saying is such, and we've not been focused on this piece, and so this piece is then really about what are the things that are causing women to leave, and I think both of us have you know it is it is the lack of paid leave, it is the lack of childcare or supports, it's a lack of flexibility. Those are the things like the the ability to let a mom, a, a woman be a working mom and an ideal worker and an ideal mom at the same time. And so I think that what I've been struggling with to your question is how do you do that? And so as you said, are, are we 
is it is a top-down strategy or is it a bottom-up? Is it women in the workforce in that middle saying, I will only say if you support me with my childcare or if you make this corporate policy change, or are you pushing all of the CEOs and the HROs to say, these are the things that we want to do to allow women to stay? And I think it's probably a little bit of both. I mean, what do you, what do you think? It's a little bit of both, but again, we have to get women into operating roles. We have to get women to be considered on par with the men, instead of saying, we're going to put women in all the staff roles, and then say, we're not going to consider them for CEO positions. So you have to really think about how um, you know, we get the message at the top that we have to grow CEO women. We have to grow them from the bottom up. Uh, and um, I don't think that realization has yet come. And we keep talking about women CEOs, the wrong problem to address. There's so many things to think about when you guys are stretching everything and in such a short time. So I want to say thank you. I think I want to just come back to maybe a couple of things that I wanted to focus on. First, I think the comment about structural change is required, right, versus operational change. But the second thing that I want to come back to, I'm trying to distill a little bit of everything you guys, so I apologize for mm -hmm. zooming in and ask my question. The second thing that really stuck with me was the idea of why companies need to take care of the family, right? Mm -hmm. And the rest of the problem solves itself structurally. If the companies realize it's a whole family that's part of their family, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the second point I wanted to echo. But I want to come back just to a quick thing. And to your point about lack of perfection. So I grew up in the Midwest, right? Companies I grew up with were like Caterpillar, John Deere, GM, right? Now, when I went there 30 years ago, it was very okay, right, to see husbands and wives working in the same company. Mm -hmm. It was perfectly okay to talk about kids at school and exactly what you said, to say, I've, I've got to leave at four because I'm training a baseball game. Everything was part of it. As a person in the ecosystem, somebody would call me and say, hey, I've got a new daughter-in-law. Do you think you can hire her? It was all perfectly okay. Mm. Like, we actually thought of everybody, kids would intern in college, be in, in this place. Company, yeah. And it was not surprising to have a third generation person working in the company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? I think, I want to go back to the point because I felt like somewhere in the mid to late 80s, maybe early 90s, we actually broke the family contract. Mm -hmm. Right? As businesses. We said that is, I'll use the word nepotism. Right? But the families cared about the company, the company cared about the families, and I think the problem you guys are making is absolutely correct. I worry about the fact that most families have to worry about their parents, even in this country. Mm -hmm. So it's not a child problem, it's a right. yeah. And so going back to your question, I have only one question of this. Uh, what have you lost from that? I know that the, the women were not necessarily, right? I'm not arguing that. Way. But as we go to this new world of the metaverse, right, where it creates new degrees of freedom, yet creates new challenges, remote workforces. What is the structures that we want to protect that work for us while we define them? So I, I want to kind of ask the question where I want to stay on the structure, stay on the fact that it's a family, right? It's just the heart of the problem. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the kids, but the parents going forward. And how do we deal with it? Because as you said, the care economy is in fact getting bigger, right? And uh, so I'm just going to stop there and maybe just leave the door open for whatever. No, it's yeah. just amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, I, I don't know. I think it's just a great summary, right? It's uh, a summary. Uh, of, of, of kind of what we're talking about, and I think to put it... Put it okay. No, they were, the, the companies of the past realized they were embedded in society, and they owed society a duty of care. Agree with that. Um, you know, today people talk about nepotism because sometimes companies took it too far. You know, a company in a small town uh, employed everybody in the town. So it was brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, everybody. You never got diverse thinking. You got very uniform thinking, which was very comforting. 
But having so other people think like you doesn't mean you're getting the right. It's easy to do work with them, but it's not the best outcome for the company. So in order to shake up the thinking, we opened up the company to a lot more people from other places to come and work in the company. And a little of this, the nepotism that you talk about was lost. Uh, some of it is good, some of it is not so good. Uh, I think fast forward to today, I think the biggest change for the worse uh, is that we've lost sight of the fact that companies succeed only if societies succeed. And we have to make sure that we take this issue of duty of care to society very seriously. And when we don't care about that and just worry about employees and tools of the trade, just come in, if there's a productivity program, we're going to cut, slash, and burn, not worry about reskilling, not about retraining. Then what happens is we become an object for making money. And in many ways, we've gotten there. So there's got to be a rethink of capitalism. I love capitalism, you know. It's been the most glorious thing that's happened to the world. But capitalism today is not the way capitalism was intended when it was devised many years ago or many decades ago. So I think we've got to go back and think about how are we going to cultivate a new kind of capitalism? And I use the word cultivate a new kind of capitalism. I think we have to think about this carefully. And I, I think to, to add to that, it's not a fantasy. Because I think we were doing some, we had some of those values 20 years ago. And I think when you look at other countries, yeah. the Swedes, France, they have, they have this model. And it's working. And Rashma, I think you made it a point. Both of you are making a point. It's not a political issue. It's a... It's a human issue, more than a human issue. It's also an economic issue. Yeah, You've laid out some yeah. strong numbers. You know, what, it, what does it cost for a father and mother to mm -hmm. be run out of work when you don't have good childcare? There are not enough men in childcare where there's a scarcity, right? There's 1.6 trillion if we were like Norway. These are very strong economic numbers that go on top of doing the right thing. Sorry. about how to affect change. You talked about it's both top down, thank you, as well as bottom up. And I want to know, just in terms of a call to action, in terms of all of us in this room, um, what can we do to play our small part in terms of affecting change here? Well, I think we as, as so I think we as working moms and then allies need to build the muscle to advocate for change. Mm. And so... So I think for all of us, think about one thing that you would like to see happen at work. Now, maybe you want to have flexibility on Thursdays and Fridays. Maybe you are not a mom yet, but you're thinking about it, and you want to know what the paid leave policies are. I think we have to start basically advocating for ourselves and building the muscle. And I'll just speak from a mom's perspective. As moms, we're so used to being martyrs. We're breastfeeding in closets. We're not showing the pictures of our kids. We're apologizing when we have to go to a doctor's appointment. We won't even ask what a policy is because we think that we're going to be discriminated against. I think IVF coverage is a great example of how this changes. Basically, five years ago, less than 0.1% of companies were covering IVF. Now everybody does. How how did that happen? Because people were coming into interviews and saying, do you cover fertility? Not just women, but men too. And basically the same thing needs to happen on the package of benefits that we're talking about family, whether that's paid leave, whether that's childcare, whether that's elderly care, because the future is going to be, it's going to be, I guess I, I sometimes think that like McKinsey and those people are like gods, is like we're going to basically have, it's going to be like managed care in terms of the policies that you're providing in the workplace. So the quicker we start asking about this, the quicker we're going to get to a world where every company is providing it. Right behind Valerie. Uh, hi, my name is Sindhu. I also work at Morgan Stanley, and thank you all for your time. Indra, I actually just finished your book a couple of weeks ago, so Reshma, I'm like very excited to open yours tonight. Um, but my question for Indra, something that resonated with me from your book is it seemed very similar to my parents' story. My parents both uh, came from Bangalore when mm -hmm. they got their masters. And what a lot of what you spoke about was similar to, I think, a lot of what my parents struggled with, but you were the voice for them, if that makes sense, because they wouldn't tell my sister and I about it. So my question for you and Reshma, you as well, is 
in those times of struggle and working hard, but also coming home to take care of the family. I remember a uh, story you mentioned when you got a promotion and, and you came home and, and I believe it was your mother-in-law or your mother said, you leave that in the garage and then you come home. I mean, my mom told me yesterday, she was like, oh, did I tell you I got a promotion two weeks ago? And I was like, no, that's so important. Why didn't you tell me? So in those struggles and balancing work and succeeding at work, but also as family, what really kept, what kept you going in terms of your strength and, and your mental well-being? You know, everybody asked me that question. And I mentioned in the book someplace, I'm wired in a way that I don't know why I'm wired that way. I really don't. Because I don't sleep. I want to sleep. I can't sleep. Um, and for some reason, I have this burning urge to contribute and contribute and contribute. And I wish I wasn't wired that way because it is tiring, you know. It's like you go to sleep and you go, wait a minute, I want to finish reading everything there is about the virus. When I was co-chairing Reopen Connecticut, I was like a person who was obsessed about COVID. And I wouldn't sleep because I had to learn everything about COVID in order to be able to chair this Reopen Connecticut properly. So I don't wish my wiring on anybody. But perhaps this wiring is what it takes to be CEO. I don't know the answer because that CEO job was tough. You know, between CFO, president, and CEO, I did 75 quarters of earnings release, okay? Each quarter is stressful. Whether you like it or not, it's a stressful quarter. And so I don't know if I want all of you to aspire to that kind of wiring because it will cause mental breakdown. It didn't for me because for some reason, from the time I was a kid, we were encouraged to multiplex. We were encouraged to look at 10 different things. If you want to have sanity in your life, if you want to have a balanced you know, life using all the technologies you have today, don't start off by saying, I want to be CEO. It's tiring. Start off by saying, I just want to do my job very well and then let the chips fall. And if you feel you're not being respected at your workplace, get the hell out. That's all I can tell you. Because if you start off saying, I laid out a plan to be senior vice president in 10 years, is now year eight and I'm nowhere close to it, I must be a failure, that's a problem. Don't do that. Okay, you have to build your own sanity mechanisms. Why don't we take uh, two more questions and then maybe John start bringing lunch around. Uh, two more questions. Thank you. Um, I guess I just, this is fascinating, and thank you both, and thank you all three, Seema too. Um, I wanted to get your points of view, because I respect everything you all say, about the idea of Asian Americans being the model minority. And you juxtapose that against the social unrest of Black Lives Matter in 2020 and beyond. And what is the intersection between the Asian American community and the black community specifically, which has often been wrought because they look at us in a certain way and, and we don't know how to look at them in oftentimes. And, you know, leading a corporation and being, you know, public people. I think about this a lot, <coughs> excuse me, in my own life and even running, you know, small businesses and what do, what, what is the responsibility? People sometimes look at me and say, wow, it's so amazing what you've done. And I said, I wonder if I could have done this if I was a black man and not, the son of Indian immigrants. And so I'd love your thoughts about you know, the intersection of our community with the black community and, and, and generally about this idea of us being the model minority. I'll let you take it first, Reshma, then I'll take it. I mean, this is, this is the, I think about this all the time too, right? Like, could I have built Girls Who Code if I was a black woman? Would I, would I have the same opportunities? Would people look at me the same, you know, with, with a sense of like, you know, uh, would it be the same? And, and I, I think the answer is no. And I think that there is, you know, just like there's white male privilege that's unearned, I think that there is Asian American privilege that is unearned. I think the complicated piece of this is that I think for many of us, I grew up in a working class family. You know, I had $300,000 in student loan debt. So I don't have the same privilege, you know what I mean, as somebody else. Uh, that was wealthy or white. So I think it's complicated. And I think we talk about it as if it is complicated. For me, though, I, you know, when I started Girls Who Code, I made sure that, you know, half the seats that we had were black and Latina. So every day I, I did send away little Reshmas, you know what I mean, for girls who looked, and I, and I would, and I, because it's true. 
you know, that there's a certain amount of privilege that you have being Asian that you just don't have when you're black and Latina. Uh, when I stepped down as the CEO of Girls Who Code, um, you know, I, I, I made sure that I got to pick my successor, and she's a black woman. And she was the woman who was Tariqa, Dr. Tariqa Barrett, who is my right-hand woman for the past three years. And she's smarter than me. She just is. And so I've always seen a lot of women, you know, that I've had, who I worked with, who are friends of mine, that it's never been about performance and privilege, that we still live in a society that is deeply cast in race and racial discrimination that we have to basically call. And then what is our responsibility when we have power and privilege to, to reset that? Very well put. I'll just add uh, to what Reshma said. I think as Asians, we are not together. So we have our own racist tendencies amongst ourselves. Uh, you know, I, I sit on various Asian American boards and I don't even know what is Asian American. I mean, look, there's an Indian American Hall of Fame. Why don't you join the Asian American Hall of Fame? Because we've never had Indians in the Asian American Hall of Fame. But aren't we all Asians? Okay, when we get to Asian hate, Indians go, that's not hate against Indians, let's duck. Yeah. Okay, think about it. And then, we all don't integrate with African Americans either, with black people. That is a problem with Asians, okay? So, I think we can talk about race here as if we are colorblind or anything blind. I think as a community, we have a bit of reckoning to do as a group because we are about the most racist as they come. And so I think we have to contemplate our own navel and say, how are we going to change the thinking amongst us so we are more welcoming of people of all kinds? So I hate to say that, but that is the reality. Uh, first hand went up there in the back. Um, I come from the international development space and I work for an organization that is very flexible. You know, I can tell them I'm going to pick up my daughter from school or take her to soccer, but I'm making a sacrifice, right? I miss that meeting or I miss that opportunity. So I really, I really appreciate everything you're saying about it having to be structural. And there is also that perception piece, right? And there has to be an acceptance of if I have to miss an important meeting, and I did miss an important meeting to come here and hear you all speak, there should be, the, there should be that push from the corporate side, from the institutional side, to move that meeting for the person that has to miss the meeting. And so I just wanted to make that clear because I think that doesn't happen. And we are still in a space where institutionally things are not shifting. So it has to happen on the individual level but also on the community level and also at the institutional systems level. Um, a lot of my questions were already asked, but I want to ask about mental health specifically. You know, COVID has really brought out the mental health conversation, but in international development, we've been talking about it for decades. Um, so I want to hear a little bit about your stories around that. I want to go back to the comment you made. I, I, now I'm going to put my CEO hat on for a second, okay? I want to tell you that this conversation about flexibility, we have to be very, very careful, guys, because I'm thinking as a CEO, how do you build teamwork? How do you build the soul of the company? How do you build culture if people don't come to work? Most of the conversations happen in the corridor. You know, we have glass in front of all the conference rooms. I could pop my head into any conference room and say, hey, you know the slide you've got up there? I don't think it's right. I think you're approaching the problem wrong. They got the benefit of real-time leadership thinking from other people. You ran into people in the cafeteria, you ran into them in the corridors, and you built community in the company. I'm all for flexibility. I wish I had flexibility when my kids were small so I could pick them up the, off the school bus. So we went from, everybody in the office went to uh, work remotely. Now we're talking about everybody coming back but we don't know what the resting point is going to be. We have to do some experiments. Should different groups come in at different times of the week? Does everybody come in three days of the week and get two days of flexible options? We have to have a discussion. If we leave it to the employees, women will one more, once more end up working remotely and taking care of the kids at home. Many guys will come to work because we'll go back to the ideal worker definition and we'll create two classes of citizen, citizens. And guess who's going to get promoted? The people you see at work because they know how to develop people and you really see leadership in action. There's a second problem. We talk about companies as if everybody's a knowledge worker. 
What about the factory worker, the truck driver, the person who has to actually haul and stuff into your factory? Those people have zero flexibility. They have to come to work 24-7 on regular shifts and night shifts. What you'll end up in, good old manufacturing companies, we talked about the value creators, remember? The value creating companies? All of them will have two classes of workers. The office worker who rolls out of bed, gets on Zoom, and rolls back into bed, and the factory worker still has to commute for anywhere from half an hour to two hours to come to work. What kind of a company and a culture are we going to build? So please, when we have these conversations about future of work, I'd rather talk about a new work day that says, at 3 o'clock, go home, take your kids off the school bus. Shut the trading floor down at 3 o'clock so the people on the trading floor can go pick up their kids from school. If they want to, give them the choice. But don't just start off by saying people should be able to work from anywhere at any time as long as the delivery is there. It only applies to knowledge workers who can stare at a computer screen and still be human at the end of it. I think we are going down some dangerous avenues of discussion in society as a whole, which I'm worried about, to be honest, because we are doing everything to take the human out of humanity. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to put the human back in humanity. Yeah. I think this idea of design and testing is very critical at this moment and, and also making sure we don't create these two. And that's what's happening right now. Every company that I've talked to that has given people the option, the young boys are in the office five days a week, the moms are at home doing laundry in between Zoom meetings, and, and, and you're already creating, and we already have, we haven't like done away with the judgment that we have about FaceTime and who's in the office. That hasn't just disappeared in two years. And so we have to reconcile these things and put in real protections in place. You know, your question about mental health, I think, is, is, is huge. Um, and I think, you know, removing the stigma around mental health. I want to, you know, give a shout out to all the millennials who did that for me as a CEO really well. When they came in, they said, what's your benefits on therapy? I was like, what? You know, we're talking about this openly. And so, you know, I do think we're moving out of a pandemic where people are traumatized, they're broken. You know, for the first time ever, you have the right rate of black girl suicide skyrocketing, the rates of mothers committing su suicide skyrocketing. So communities before that didn't have, you know, the same mental health concerns, you're seeing this pop up. And so I do think it's something that right every CEO and every company needs to be focused on. Let's take the last question. I promised to feed the panel, so uh, it's been fantastic. I think uh, you had a question from the rip. Uh, I specifically, and thank you again, I really enjoyed the conversation from both of y'all. I specifically was interested in, in y'all's commentary on having the confidence and getting your kids involved in debate and having folks speak up. I was fortunate to have parents that encouraged that. I'm sure you both of you were too. Um, Rich encourages me every day. We um, but I feel like a lot of people in the community don't have that person. They don't. They don't have the benefit of, of seeing uh, Indra Anasari or you know whatever it might be in that moment that really gets you going. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how we can perhaps institutionalize helping Asian Americans, immigrant children at a younger age, to have that confidence, to have to have uh, the ability to speak up, to participate in sports teams, whatever it might be. So it's been just to create that foundation. For you know, uh, last year, I think yeah, I think it was last year, I reached out to the local uh, India Cultural Center in Greenwich and I said, I want to mentor 20 kids. And, uh, you know, 10 uh, freshmen and sophomores and 10 juniors, seniors, equal mix of men and women. And I'm going to meet with them every week. Uh, I was meeting them with them in two separate groups, but then they became one group. And I stayed with them for almost a year. And I still am in touch with all of them. It was amazing. From the time I started with them, the time I finished with them, the kids who walked in and wimpily shook hands with me were the most confident ones. They were walking straight. They were smiling more. Uh, they, just, they were just different people. So it was a lot of time, OK? Here's my point. There's a lot of people like me, a lot of people like Reshma out there, may not be doing girls who invest or girls who code, um, but doing amazing things. If all of us took on the job to coach and develop 20 kids, one day, I mean, two hours a week, I think we can make a difference on a large scale very fast. 
but it requires time commitment. Uh, in my case, I was an empty nester, so I had the time to do it. There are a lot of people who are empty nesters too, or don't have kids. So you've got to give up two hours of binge watching to mentor somebody else. I think it should be institutionalized. Yeah. I mean, the second group is uh, pushing to get started. But the first group is saying, we don't want to give up the space. We want some more yeah. time. So there's a tussle going on whether the first group will allow me to take a second group. But that's a good problem to have. Because these kids are just blossoming in fantastic ways. Yeah, and, and I think the interest point too, I, I, do, I do look at, the, and I think the black community does this very well, at the highest levels, you know, black girl magic, right? Don't you feel like there's so, there's so much more, because part of this is the ability to, to give knowledge, to use your platform, to uplift other people and uh, other people's projects. And I do think as a community, we have to get a, do a much better job. And Manish threw, to, you know, threw a great dinner you know, in, Holly, in, in Hollywood during the, the Oscars, right? About you know, galvanizing everybody who is an actor, an actress, a producer, and it's amazing. And I think it was in the New York Times, and I think people realize, oh, there's brown people that act? Wow, right? And you know, similarly, I think we just need to build these communities of people and then use our power and our platform to lift one another up when people's stars are rising. It feels like the Asian community is getting better at that, but clearly there's a lot of inroads and, and work for progress. Because I'm married to a man who happens to be Jewish. The way his community comes together to help each other out, OK, you're up for an interview. Who's interviewed with this guy? How, what's, what's the type of comp I should be asking for? We're not doing that yet in the Asian community. Yeah. There's opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. thank you. Great. Well, a real big thank you to Indra Nui, Reshma Sajani, and Seema Modi. Thank you to John Wong and AABDC. For those of you who don't know the organization, I think, uh, in two, I guess I was an awardee in 2011, but. Uh, um, when I first got an award in 2011, I came into AABDC and I realized uh, not a lot of people thought the Indian community was part of the Asian community and there weren't a lot of brown faces in there. So my goal was to start nominating, you know, from the Indian community. So whether it was uh, Dinesh Paliwal and Mahmood Khan, so many people have come through those doors. So I'm really happy for the organization. Uh, it's a, it's a not-for-profit, and John is sort of a one-man show. So go to the website and see how you can help him. So special thanks to John for providing this forum. Thank you, John. My thank yous at the uh, dinners usually go, uh, you know, seven or eight minutes. They're supposed to be one. So I'm going to wrap this up to say, you know, none, none of this happens. We're coming through a tough time where marketing and sponsorship doesn't always happen, and organizations like this need the capital to bring this up. So, special thanks to uh, to da, uh, uh, Dada. I don't know if they have stuff about what they do, but I think if you take time um, and understand it, it's a uh, it's sort of the first entry to the metaverse, and uh, or not maybe not first to Real Eats, a meal delivery service that uh, is a little bit different. Um, it is, uh, as opposed to the others that are 45 minutes, it's six minutes, Sufi wrapped, and uh, you, uh, you, you microwave it, and you have a gourmet meal, and helps you, uh, you know, be a better, better parent. I think Dan started when he was a single parent, said I can't take them to McDonald's or Wendy's, I gotta do something healthier. So, and of course, to my firm, to Morgan Stanley Private Wealth, who's very well represented. Um, thank you to everyone, and please enjoy your lunch.